Europeans in some agreements. Uh, Which is unusual. Unusual, <laughs> agreed. <laughs> Mark of uh, Perry Match will start, and then Marino, and then uh, Nick Ashford of the London Times, and Tom Keelinger of the Bell. And if we have time. You mean if I filibuster on the first question, I don't that, have to take it? <laughs> <laughs> That's all right, as long as there's a gap in the tape eventually. eventually. <laughs> you too. Sorry? Yes. Well, Mr. President, Mr. Mitterrand is the first French president who is a socialist president in France, and he invites his fellow heads of state and government in a king's palace. How do you feel about all that? Oh, well, uh, having been a visitor at Versailles myself uh, once before, some years ago, I'm looking forward to it and uh, to seeing all that beauty again, but well, it seems to me that uh, wasn't Louis XIV known as the Sun King? Maybe we'll all go there for enlightenment. <laughs> and uh, uh, how close you are with Mr. Mitterrand and what kind of relationship, how, how, how often do you communicate with him and how do you feel? Well, I don't know what the schedule has been for previous presidents, but in this year and a half or so that I've been here, uh, I have met uh, several times, more than once, with uh, all the leaders that I will be meeting with in a very open relationship, uh, in the meetings that we've had in Ottawa, in Cancun, here in Washington. So, uh, and I think it's a, uh, I think it's been a most helpful thing. I think that the, I think we have a closer relationship perhaps than has existed before, and I mean all the leaders of our, of the North American Alliance and the summit meeting that will be uh, there in Versailles. But in between the meetings, do you communicate and how with the, with the language barrier and all that? Well, we have to resort to interpreters and uh, I've learned to get along with that. Uh, some of the others uh, speak uh, some English. I've, uh, I had a couple of years of schoolboy French many, many years ago because it was compulsory in the school that I attended. But uh, I couldn't rely on it uh, myself now. And I, have, uh, I shouldn't be taking up all this time. But I told uh, uh, the president about uh, an experience that I had with uh, having to use French the first time that I ever went to France. I went with a couple from England, I'd been in London for the winter, and we went across the Channel in the spring to go down to the south of France. I didn't know that they had never crossed the Channel before, and they knew not one word of French, and we were going to drive in their car. And I realized that if there was any communication, it was going to be up to me. And we were coming to a town where we were going to have lunch, and I was thinking and trying to dredge up all the words that I could remember as to how to find the best cafe. And as words began to come back to me, I sort of padded my part. And we did arrive in a little town. There was a gendarme in the street. We pulled up beside him, and by this time I was ready. And I said, pardon, monsieur, j'ai grand faim. Où est ma café? But with six Western European head of state uh, and government, you will all be seven be meeting again together, and again, this may sound unusual perhaps to some. Uh, what have you accomplished since then, uh, not only on a personal level, but also in terms of politics? What have you accomplished collectively, for instance, that you could not accomplish separately? Well, I've always believed that a lot of problems are resolved uh, if you are talking to each other instead of about each other. And I think that there have been tensions uh, in the past that have affected uh, us as allies and friends. We all share a great many mutual problems. Uh, we're all having economic problems. Uh, unemployment is a, is a problem for us. And uh, I think that the bond, of the, the personal bond that we've established has created a relationship that uh, is very close and that makes us able to discuss openly and freely uh, those things that are of mutual interest to us, those problems where maybe uh, we can solve them better together uh, than we can by going our own way. 
Last year you heard some complaints from the Europeans on the high rates of interest in the United States and you told them that the United States was suffering from those high rates as well. Certainly your assertion looks a little bit more credible now. And now the Europeans are complaining about unemployment, which does great damage to the social economic fabric of Europe, or Western Europe. What will you tell them now, given the fact, again, that unemployment is also a problem in this country, it's low recovery, what will you be discussing with them in concrete ways to face this problem? Well, I think, I think that the answer has to be a correction. Uh, you can't correct unemployment unless you correct the, the problems that have caused a virtually worldwide recession. And these have to do with trade. These have to do with uh, uh, import and export. And I think all the things that, uh, that we can put on the table that may be uh, restricting the free flow of trade, uh, things that could stimulate uh, markets, are essential to that. When, the, when they had the feeling about the high interest rates, I believe there was an honest misunderstanding that they thought these were somehow a part of our policy of our economic policy, that we were using high interest rates uh, because of our double-digit inflation. Uh, they weren't. And I think they've begun to realize that uh, we have here uh, in the Federal Reserve System an autonomous body that is not subject to pressure of any kind from those of us who hold office, but that in addition the interest rates are set somewhat or very much by the marketplace itself, <coughs> uh, the money market here. and. We believe that, in our case, the high interest rates were the result of inflation. Well, now we have brought inflation down. The doom criers were saying that a year ago that it would take 10 years to get a handle on the inflation problem. Well, last month, inflation actually disappeared for a month in America, and we had deflation. And uh, now this last month or the month after that, uh, while it came up just a fraction of a percentage point uh, above the, the level, we're down to where for the last six months uh, inflation is, has been around the 3% mark. And when these, uh, I think that we're going to see even more improvement uh, as we go on through the year on an annualized basis, it's down to that point. We think this is a big factor and that if we in our Congress now can get the savings that we're asking for in the budget for 1983. We think it'll send a signal to the money markets that will bring interest rates down further. We don't believe that we were the cause of, of Europe's problems. Uh, uh, we could point to uh, Italy's own interest rates, which are uh, twice and three times the <coughs> interest rates of Germany and, and, uh, and Japan. And they, I don't think, have had any effect on, on those countries. But I think that they now understand that this was not a deliberate part of an economic policy. This was a problem uh, that we're trying to lick. If I could uh, follow up on that point, uh, Mr. President, while inflation has come down, and most of the other economic indicators are still fairly grim. I talk about. Uh, 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 the rate of corporation failures, uh, savings that haven't really picked up, uh, and unemployment, of course, is at uh, almost record levels. And then one's also got this record budget deficit as well. Now, when at Ottawa last year, you linked the question of interest rates to a revitalization of the US economy. Uh, but this re revitalization doesn't seem to have, uh, have started yet. Can you say, I mean, what has gone wrong from this end? And when will you be able to assure the European leaders that happy days are here well, again? Well, I don't believe that anything has gone wrong. I think that many people confuse the adoption by Congress <coughs> of the first phase of our plan uh, with uh, the plan being in operation. You have to realize that we asked for, we believe very much in the incentive tax package that we passed, the, the reducing of taxes. But that's to be spread over a three-year period. We had asked for originally three 10% cuts in the income tax. Uh, we got one 5% cut, and then the other two were 10%, but they have not yet gone into effect. 
We had also asked that those tax cuts be retroactive to January 1st, 1981. And we, in the compromise that goes on in a parliament or a congress, we had to take the best that we could get. The 5% cut, not 10, went into effect not until October, last October. We did see an immediate increase in personal savings rates. After that it happened because of some features of the tax program. But if there is an incentive to those tax cuts, as we believe there is, we have to wait until the people are actually getting those cuts and having that extra money in their pockets. So the next cut, the 10% cut, will go into effect July 1st, and then the next one a year from then, in July of 1983. So I think that what we have to wait and see is when the program is actually in operation, when the effects are felt, not just the fact that you can point to a piece of legislation and say, well, it's been passed into law, uh, wait till it takes effect, but I think there have been. When you stop to think that in the last six months of 1980, during the campaign, uh, the increase in our money supply, the flooding of paper money, was, was the highest it has ever been in our history, at a 13% rate. And with it came the interest rates that skyrocketed to 21.5%. And we had two years back to back of double digit inflation. And when I took office, inflation was 12.4%. Now, they pulled the string on the money market the, at about that same time, way down to below the normal needs. And so uh, we, had a, we had a problem with the interest rates. They hung on for a while. But from the very first, in getting our cuts in, in government spending, the billions of dollars in reductions, the spending rate of increase in spending was 17% in 1980, the annual rate of increase. We cut that in half in the, in the first year that we were here. Now, with that, the interest rates did come down about 20%. Not enough, but they did come down. But the inflation, the unemployment, I mean, the, the recession, the unemployment, had begun in the 1979. We had what was called a recession in 1980, with all these other things going on. And it did continue, and we've had this market dislocation, this inflation. Well, inflation uh, increases government costs quite considerably. I mean, un unemployment increases them quite considerably. We feel that, on the evidence of history, that unemployment is the last thing that recovers when you're coming out of a recession. But we think the, the indices are all there, that we are in the trough and have bottomed out in that recession. And we, from the very first, said that we could not hope for recovery until the last half of this year. And we think in the last half we are going to see that recovery. How far is that <coughs> recovery dependent on you breaking the, the budget stalemate. Do you think you would have that stalemate ended by the time you go to that? I think it is very important. I think the money market is waiting to see if the Congress will, since we don't dominate or have the majority in both houses, if the Congress will stay with its old-fashioned policies of artificial stimulation of the market and quick fixes to uh, uh, cure things, which all they ever did was uh, temporarily uh, reduced the fever, and then a couple of years later we had an even worse recession each time. Um, but if they see that Congress will do what it did last year and stay with us on our plan and make the further reductions that we're asking for in spending, stay with our tax program, I think that this will be the signal that will uh, bring interest rates down. There have been signs, scattered signs, in the money market, that they want them down also. The signs being uh, in various areas, our automobile industry, which is hard hit, and mainly because of the interest rates. Our people buy the cars, as I'm sure they do elsewhere, on the installment plan. They have to play, pay interest on the I mortgage on never, the never any which is on the house. <laughs> and this has hurt the automobile market. Well, here and there in the country, groups of bankers, local bankers, have gotten together and put up sums of money 
specified for automobile loans at a rate of interest about four points below the market. And as long as that money lasted, they would lend it at that lower interest rate for those who wanted to buy automobiles. And the upsurge in automobile buying was instant. Well now, this shows and indicates to us we've seen some building companies, construction companies, that evidently were able to liquidate their inventory of newly built houses by themselves putting, pulling down the interest rate. And again, the same thing was happening. And we think that this indicates that the money market is ready and wants to do it. But they have to be sure that we have inflation down uh, for good, that it isn't going to go zooming back up. Mr. President, if I may go uh, beyond the summit in Versailles for my question, there's another summit looming, and that is the NATO summit, the Bonn summit. It's almost like an alpine assault. You scale one summit after another. And uh, as you talk about NATO nowadays, immediately you are into this crisis talk. Uh, we've had a, a year behind us where things didn't all go smoothly, and the relations between America and the European allies were somewhat strained. Um, indeed, there are cries right now in Congress for a withdrawal of American troops to show the Europeans how upset you are, how satisfied with their performance. How much do you think is, is, is true about this crisis talk? Do you view the alliance uh, in a similar way? Uh, and if so, where would you say one can improve the performance of these 15 years? I think we have performed. <coughs> I think it, it has improved. And I think the recent meeting of ministers in Luxembourg uh, indicates this. I think when we came into office, this administration, uh, there were some strains in the alliance, and there was some ill feeling, both both sides. We set out to resolve that, and I think we've we've done it. The I believe in the North Atlantic Alliance Treaty, and I think the fact that we've had 37 years of peace there in Europe is the greatest proof of its effectiveness. We have no intention of withdrawing uh, troops. We recognize our responsibility there. We recognize that this is not, uh, those troops aren't there as some have said in congressional debate that that, that is uh, something that we're generously doing for someone else. Uh, our own security is involved. We're there because that NATO line is our first line of defense as well. And I think the relationship uh, now, I don't think there's any crisis at all. I think that NATO is, uh, is on a better footing than it has been for some several years. And we're, where there could be and has been some problems at the southern flank of NATO, uh, we are working on those and I think have come to some better agreements there. You think about Greek, Greek and Greece and Turkey, Greece and Turkey. Turkey. but yes. Yeah. Um, now on this uh, subject, follow-up question, I suppose, can you envisage um, um, a likely scenario or a, a, um, a constellation of political crises where America would have to look beyond NATO because it had global commitments and where the importance uh, for you of NATO will somewhat di would be diminished and you will have to go back to your NATO allies and say they'll have to pick up more for their own defenses because you have global commitments that require a greater deployment of American forces. Well, so far, in spite of the economic problems that beset Europe as well as the United States, uh, I think that their uh, spending level has, uh, has been uh, uh, consistent and uh, uh, have no, I have no quarrel with it at all. With regard to the part of your question about other areas, uh, oh, and incidentally, as evidence of the improved situation, uh, could I point out that uh, we've had cooperation from our NATO allies with regard to the multiple force in the Sinai, and yet when we came here a year ago, uh, uh, we hadn't been able to find a single country that wanted to participate in that. Now they have. I, I think that a, a subject for discussion with NATO would be uh, that NATO, that we all together look at the Persian Gulf, the Middle East, as an area of concern because of our energy dependence uh, on that particular area. Uh, that would be a, a new subject for NATO to discuss. But the, uh, 
No, I think the, uh, the Allies are, are uh, holding up their end very well. And as I say, I think there is a, a better, sounder relationship than we've had in the past. Part of the question of how well NATO is doing seems to be tied into the question of East-West relations in general. Yes. Um, and we have heard that you now favor a summit meeting with your um, uh, Soviet counterpart. You used to tie this to the condition that such summit meetings should have a tangible outcome, a result. Do you feel the time has come where such a meeting could accomplish something concrete? I would hope so, because I think that the Soviet Union uh, also has some very real problems. And uh, maybe it's time uh, for someone to point out to them that their, their attitude of hostility, their worldwide aggression, their denial of human rights, whatever it's based on, uh, whether it is a concern that they are threatened by the Western world, or whether it is just uh, determination to pursue the Marxist-Lenin uh, theory of world domination. And maybe someone should point out to them that uh, the road to peace and uh, giving up of that aggressive intent uh, might be helpful to them with their own uh, economic problems. The, the Soviet Union, if there is any truth to, uh, to the belief of some that, that they're motivated by fear of the West, that, that they think the West is going to threaten them, I don't think there's anyone in the West uh, who believes that for one minute. Uh, they could have a guarantee of peace tomorrow if they themselves would follow the teachings or the words of Demosthenes 2,000 years ago in the Athenian marketplace when he said, what sane man would let another man's words rather than his deeds tell him who is at peace and who is at war with him? And so far, it is the West that has to feel that the Soviet Union is at war with us on the basis of their <clears throat> great military buildup. I don't think they can point to anything from our side that indicates uh, that. What if back some years ago after World War II, when our country was the only one with the nuclear weapon, and really the only one left undamaged by war, in a position to do as we did, to go to the aid of our allies and even our former enemies. What if the situation had been reversed? The Soviet Union had had that bomb and not anyone in the West. If we had an aggressive intent, wouldn't we have acted then when we could have done it so easily? I think it's the greatest guarantee that it isn't the West that threatens the world with war. Mr. Yeah. President, may I ask you a question about the essence of the presidency? Because on paper, you are the most powerful man on earth. In practice, I keep you are telling my wife that. <laughs> <laughs> in, 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 in practice, you have at least some difficulties vis a vis interest rates, even avoiding a war on the Falklands. Uh, what, which, in your view, is the limits of the presidency? What can you really achieve? <laughs> oh, sometimes I ask myself that question. <laughs> The, uh, uh, there are limits, of course, uh, great limits on the presidency, because the very nature of our government and our constitution has prescribed them to an extent beyond anything, I think, known in uh, any other country. Uh, many countries have constitutions, but most of them say, we the government, they say in their constitution, we the government grant you, the people, these things. Our Constitution says we, the people, will allow government to do only these things that we permit in the Constitution. And that's reflected in uh, this supposed power of the presidency. Uh, a president can't dismiss a, a Congress 
and a, and a unlike the parliamentary system, uh, uh, you do not automatically have a majority in what constitutes our parliament, our Congress here. So that in one of the two houses, uh, I have uh, a majority of the opposition party. In the other house, the Senate, I have a bare majority of our party, and that's the first time that's been true for a Republican president in 25 years. Mr. President, in a few days, you will be visiting the four major European partners of the United States in the Atlantic Alliance. Three of these, uh, West Germany, Britain, and Italy, have pledged uh, to go ahead and modernize the nuclear weapons of NATO in the decision that was taken in December 79. Uh, in fact, in my country has already started work on our cruise missile base. How do you assess the contribution of Italy and generally the prospect for productive negotiations in the area of intermediate nuclear forces? Well, I must tell you, we're very grateful to uh, Italy with regard to the forthrightness with which Italy stepped forward uh, with regard to the basing of those intermediate missiles. We know why the missiles uh, have been requested of us. Because there are 900 warheads on 300 SS-20 missiles in the Soviet uh, targeted on all of Europe and nothing to counter them. And so the request came for Pershing missiles and cruise missiles uh, as a deterrent to prevent them from ever having that or continuing that <clears throat> monopoly. And uh, I know that politically, uh, in Europe, this was a great problem in, in a number of countries because of, of the peace movement and all, and some people, they couldn't... Some people can't quite see that unilateral disarmament is not the road to peace. But Italy was very, as I say, forthright in coming forth and saying yes, and we, we appreciate it very much. At the same time, finally, by the very fact that Countries of Europe and Italy virtually in the lead were uh, willing to say yes, base these missiles, deploy them here, and we were willing to provide them. That's why the Soviets, I think, agreed to go to Geneva and meet us when I proposed, why don't we negotiate a total elimination of such weapons in Europe? We won't put in the Pershings and cruise missiles if they'll do away with the SS-20s. And I don't think they would have ever come to negotiate uh, had it not been for the imminence of that, of that proposal, the fact that we are all going forward. Uh, I would hope that before all those missiles are in place on our side, we would have negotiated an agreement in which they'll be unnecessary and the Soviets will remove theirs. Are you sanguine about the prospect of these negotiations? So can they be achieved, say, apart and before perhaps a larger start agreement? Well then, well of course we are now. We've completed our uh, arrangements and proposals here to go forward with the start, which has to do with the intercontinental missiles. And again, I believe that we're getting the evidence of willingness from the Soviet Union to at least negotiate, to talk, because we are going forward with the rebuilding of our own military and because our allies have shown their own determination with these intermediate weapons. In recent years, when we were letting our defenses crumble and were virtually unilaterally disarming, there was no incentive for the Soviet Union to meet us in any kind of arms reduction talk because they were engaged in the most massive buildup the world has ever seen at the same time that we were apparently not uh, willing to even try and, and keep pace. And so I think that it is, well, I think it was explained in a cartoon in one of our papers recently. It was Brezhnev speaking to a Russian general. And he said, I liked the arms race better when we were the only ones in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the, the President, in your speech at Eureka on strategic arms, your administration's previous commitment to the concept of linkage, the, the concept whereby uh, you link arms control negotiations, east-west trade, uh, uh, summary with the Soviet Union, with political progress, 
uh, by the Soviet Union on things like uh, uh, Poland and Afghanistan. This was conspicuous by its absence. Does this mean that you've abandoned the principle of No, the not at all. And let me point out that in the times, to, many times that I had spoken of that, I had never particularly linked that to a thing as specific as an arms reduction talk. But it was done in the context of the uh, many summit meetings that have taken place with regard to trade, with regard to features of detente and so forth. And I thought of it in that context, but that doesn't rule it out even for arms reduction talks. But I could answer it very briefly just with this. I think that much of what is concerned in, in that linkage, some of the very subjects you talked about, are not things that you headline in the paper. Uh, the fact that you did not uh, proclaim it or put it up there in the newspaper does not mean that it can't be brought up when you're sitting at a table. I think sometimes that politically, to publicly discuss things of that kind makes it politically impossible to get them. Uh, where maybe in what I've called quiet diplomacy, uh, you can secure them. Um, very briefly, if I may, just to, uh, to get this, uh, to get you to ask, uh, to expand a little bit on what you said, the Luxembourg. Uh